the Shelf. I'm your host, Yvonne Wolf. Today, our special guest is Dr. Almira Astudilio Gillis. Welcome, Almira. Thank you, Yvonne. Thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Let's talk about your first book. You are uh, author of many books um, in Filipino American literature in Chicago uh -huh. area. Well, let's start with your first one, Willie Wins. Sure. Well, um, so I have no formal background in writing, but then I've always loved children and I wanted to write for children. Uh, so I thought, what can I share with the youth market that's particular or special to me? And of course, drawing upon my heritage and my culture, which, which is Filipino. I was born and raised in the Philippines and just came over to the U.S. to study. I thought um, there aren't very many books on Filipino-American um, children, so I thought I'd share write one. Share a story, right? Yes, yeah, share a story. Now, how was it to find a publisher? Did you have many difficulties? Yes, um, at the time, as is now, it's very competitive. Um, I didn't have an agent. I couldn't afford one, really, because I was just starting out, uh, an emerging writer. And there weren't a lot of agents who wanted to deal with uh, multicultural literature. So they, they were pretty mainstream. So I just wrote, you know, these pieces. This was one of many of my submissions and just picked up a guide to publishers all over the U.S. and started submitting. You just like that. You received a lot of rejection letters? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every day I would get mm. about, and I was actively submitting, mm. yes. five rejection letters. Oh. Um, and it was hard not to um, get discouraged. Um, and sometimes they wouldn't even tell you what was wrong, mm. just like it's not something that we could publish. It's yeah. a generic letter. Just a generic form yes. letter, yeah. And, but... Uh, Filipino American literature is so underrepresented. Yes, it is. How did you finally, which publisher was it in the end? Well, the publisher that chose me <laughs> was Lee and Lowe in New York, and they are a multicultural publisher, and they didn't have any Filipino American books. Um, so, so it was the first one? Yeah, so <laughs> mine was the first. Um, and I was lucky enough to uh, work with the editor-in-chief on this. Um, Louise May, and she has since moved from Lee and Lowe, but uh, we, um, I submitted the, just the manuscript, mm -hmm. so the story, and worked with her on that, and they chose the illustrator, whom I have never met. In fact, I wasn't really um, asked for my opinions input. Yeah, input regarding thing. illustration. It's hard sometimes. The publisher will match you up with the illustrator. With, and the illustrator may not have any background on the Filipino-American uh -huh. uh, setting, right? Yeah, well, in this case, they did choose a Filipino-American. Oh, good. Um, which, is, which is good, yes. And I thought it, it really helped, although um, he was from Hawaii, and he was um, second generation Filipino American, and I'm f um, first. So you know, I was born and raised in the Philippines. So he had, I felt, a different perspective. And the focal point of Willie Wins is a coconut bank, something from my childhood, which my grandmother gave me. It's basically a coconut shell with a slit, mm -hmm. and that's your bank. You put coins oh, how in cute. it. And of course, he knew nothing about that because he wasn't born and raised in the Philippines. Um, so I, I'm sure he had to do his own research. Um, yes. You know. So, so sometimes you ha you end up um, teaching your illustrator. Sure. About yeah, what are you what the story you're telling? Right. Um, and this was a Filipino American story. So it was um, about a Filipino family, a Filipino boy actually. But uh, the setting was the U.S., so it wasn't, you know, set in the Philippines. Um, because Lee and Lowe at the time wanted to promote stories that were um, set in the U.S. that f American children could relate to. And yet something new, something that was of a different culture. So, Vera, your PhD is in 
social, social science, science, and then you have yes. a master's in um, political science, uh -huh. and uh, also master's in labor relations. Yes. And this, your training and professional training yeah. in education seems so different from the books you write. Right. Yeah, tell us about how you got into the biodiversity in the Philippines, something that's completely nonfiction now. Right, yes. Well, um, I started writing when I was about seven years old. Um, started writing poetry. I guess you can say that really is my first love, is writing poetry. And so from there, and these poems were published in like the school newspaper, things yes. like that, you know, so. Maybe one award or so? Um, well, not as a primary school, but mm -hmm. um, one of my short stories actually did win um, an award placed third in a national U.S. contest um, wow. for middle graders mm -hmm. um, in adventures. It yes. was an adventure story about a pearl diver. Oh. Um, and so I now write, well, practically everything, um, a novel, you know, these um, large picture book formats, um, s short stories, poetry. I've published in all of those. And I also write technical writing, yes. you know, for, for corporations. That's very encouraging because sometimes it's very intimidating, it's scary to write something um, nonfiction in uh, yeah. and about di biodiversity in the Philippines. Uh -huh. Now that book you won an award, right? Well, or? it um, I was nominated for a, an award in science in the Philippines. Um, and in the youth section? In, in right. the, well, actually, adult section, which is kind of encouraging also and surprising because it was the only book for youth in in science mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in that um, contest. It's, and um, so I, I like to think of it as an introduction to the rich biodiversity that's in the Philippines, yes. which a lot of people don't know about. So even though it's written in the language for the youth market, there are a lot of facts in there. There are tables and statistics of, you know, vanishing species and um, which species you can only find in the Philippines, especially our marine wildlife. And so it really is a book. It's more like a coffee table book, actually. And the pictures are gorgeous. I, the, the pictures were donated to me by scientists, yes, people who actually were out in the field. So and the copyright issue was a little easier. They were it? so generous. They mm -hmm. were so generous in sharing their photographs. When they found out about my project, they just mm -hmm. felt it was a book that had to be written. And so I have, let's say, a picture there of the laughing cicada from the guy who discovered, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> who found the laughing yes. cicada. So it really is I th a labor of love um, yeah. to the Philippines, well, our biodiversity there. In the Philippines being a um, country of 7,000 islands, yes. I would imagine the biodiversity would be incredible to document in a s small book. <laughs> right. And so what I did was I went across all of the species, you know, and just chose Mammals a representative. And one, Birds and, okay. right, the habitats and explained um, how the Philippines was formed and why we have such a rich biodiversity because of it's an archipelago and a lot of these just developed, you know, within the islands and yes. that, that kind of thing. Um, and a strong um, conservation component, of yes, course. Environmental awareness. Right, yeah. In fact, that's the reason why I really wrote this. I am a passionate conservationist. And so I thought, well, first, you just can't preach, especially the children, about conservation. You have to ha help them to appreciate first yes, what they yes. have, which is really temporary, mm. you know, v all these vanishing um, species. species. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you go about doing research <laughs> on something that's entirely out of your field, right? right? Yeah, well, you have to start with a strong curiosity about the world. And um, so I found that I had to ask a lot of stupid questions, yes. you know, and yes. just tell everybody, be candid. I don't, I'm not an expert here. Mm -hmm. So I'm often mistaken as, let's say, an anthropologist because I'm 
in the anthropology department w with the field museum. at the field museum, right? And I'm not. Um, I I do school visits also, and they ask, oh, so you know, you're a zoologist, and I say, no, <laughs> I'm just a writer, yeah. and I think that's really, I think, um, very illuminating and approachable right yes. because you are a writer who's curious and just letting your curiosity develop what you're going to write about right and not be afraid to ask even stupid questions yes you know so and that's uh, that's a really good way to start actually with um, not getting over the fear of stupid questions <laughs> right <laughs> and just yeah. just ask and then find out where that takes you right and you know with that, you begin to develop a good rapport with people, and they know that you know, you're really interested in finding more about them, and you let them dictate the agenda for you, mm -hmm. you know, so they have some sort of ownership in the project. Um, and so with the biodiversity book, I've, well, I dealt with a lot of scientists, of course, but also a lot of those who um, poor communities where these places are found. So yes. I go out there. So um, you, this book has, by um, the process of researching this book, you traveled a lot? Oh my gosh, I have been to places that I'm not even allowed to talk about. <laughs> 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 because how I got there is an issue. Um, you mean, uh, it's, okay. Uh, it's yeah, the Philippines is a dangerous security, place. Security, okay. Security, issue. especially the South, where, you know, there is a lot of conflict. Um, in the southern part, um, and so uh, I have very well connected friends who have who are brave and have the You're resources. You're brave to go yourself, right? Well, <laughs> you know, I and our thinking is if nobody else will do it, mm. then yes. who, will? who will? Then these yes. species will disappear. Then nobody will find out about these communities. Yes. Um, I, I guess the anthropology part is I'm very interested in indigenous cultures yes. as well, which are and also are very isolated are these yes. communities, right? So they're not, um, I don't know, can you get there by motorcycle or is this uh, kind of a yeah. hike? Uh, everything, boat? boat. Everything. I've written every, every <laughs> mode of, of transportation, little boats, small boats. Um, and you're not yeah. afraid of camping and uh, no, uh, no. ticks I, I, or <laughs> no, I, I come spiders, you're, right. all, you're yeah. okay. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and a lot of my friends are surprised right. because I, this well, was not my background, yeah. right? I'm really usually, a corporate person. Yeah. Usually not thrown into an environment where there's possibly scorpions and snakes. Or right, and also women. Yes, um, uh, yes, right? Yes, a lot of people who go out in the field are men for yes. good reason, yes. you know, because they're um, not seen as easy targets. Women, whether or not it's true, are seen as easier targets. And so, in such a uh, unfamiliar territory for you, how did you overcome that fear? Or have you always been a good? You like camping, or were you someone who's an outdoors woman? Or and actually, no, no, <laughs> so, not either. Um, yeah, all of this really developed um, only I, I would say about ten to fifteen years ago, when I felt that I should be doing something to represent the, un, the underrepresented right be of greater service yes. you know yes. and i thought okay well i had begun to really love nature mm -hmm. but the nature that i really became passionate passionate about was those in you know these really remote places because these are the more these are rare yes. and not and perhaps very sensitive to environmental change. Yes, because nobody knows about them. So nobody goes out to these dangerous remote places um, to study the wildlife there or even to learn about the communities there. Yes. So, yeah. And you were, how did you face the mosquitoes and um, well, so I Other always go with insects. friends uh -huh. um, who know the area. So okay. I, and we you always have them. local guides. Yes. And so we ask 
a lot of questions. And we're also very respectful of the practices and the beliefs there. Yes. So even if we may not believe mm -hmm. in some of the things they do, mm -hmm. you know, like religious or spiritual beliefs. Yes, local deities local. perhaps, right? Because it's not mm -hmm. particularly known to us. Right. The people who are there so long. Exactly. So uh, we... You know, we don't even question, so why are you doing this or nothing. We just leave everything behind and go there with a completely mm. open mind. And I have eaten more things than I that you never even know. You <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I like don't have... Such as what? Tell us three things that you ate that was yeah. something you had never considered before. Perhaps. Right. Um, well, so when we would go out in the field, so we would just eat at these roadside stands and in a lot of internal organs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. They use, um, like the Chinese all culture, of the all parts yes. of the animals. Yes. You don't throw anything away. Right, yes. yeah, so that. But nothing like grubs or things of insects no. type. There no, was no. one time when I was about ready to leave for return back to Chicago, and so I wasn't familiar with the food there. So all I had for like four days was Coke and crackers. Oh, yes. that's the kind of <laughs> that's the kind of food that we generally try to avoid. Exactly. <laughs> but Chips and <laughs> yeah, the Coke for the you know the um, what do you call it? So and then plus that's all they really had, and then crackers. So yeah. Um, I survived on that, but um, because also there comes a point when you can't really refuse. Yes, um, what they have, right? You, what they it's have. It's very rude to refuse, perhaps, and uh, yeah. you don't want to leave something uneaten that you don't appreciate it. Yeah, right? especially if they're poor yes, and they're yes. sharing what they have with you. Yes. Um, two years ago, I was in the upper upper highlands of the Philippines and uh, we were invited to a wedding feast mm. um, by the indigenous group there and they slaughtered a pig and I was with my children and they were all vegetarians but that's all they had <laughs> yes. and I was so proud of my son because mm. he was vegetarian they put it in, in front of him and it's yes. on the ground like a dirt ground yes right? and the whole community is invited and we were the sort of the guests of honor because we were Visitors. Visitors, yes. Right. So he ate. He ate it. Um, of course, it was fresh because that pig was running around yes. earlier. <laughs> yes. So, yes. yeah, you know. It, it and the idea of eating fresh kill, I think that's difficult for many Americans to accept. Right. My students um, don't understand that. And I tell them, well, if you're in a country with unstable refrigeration. Exactly. Which one are you going to eat? The yeah. one that had <laughs> been killed three days ago or the one that you saw that killed? The, yeah, I was just staring at you earlier. Right. Um, but yes. yeah, I, I though, I, I couldn't eat it, so I gave it to a child beside me. Yeah. Um, and so he was pretty happy. And yes. that was kind of, you know, not, not too obvious. But, but things like that, yes. you know, really be aware of cultural differences um, and be open to them and be respectful. One of the things that, you know, came really you that were that's really useful when I write things I'm not I don't know anything about. Yes, you know. to to keep a really open-minded mm -hmm. attitude. That's really a wonderful story. Then the the fire beneath is oh. a is a award-winning novel. Can you tell us about that one? Yeah, well, that now uh, we we'll go back to fiction again. <laughs> yeah, now we're in yes, and um, this. This was based in the Philippines. Um, so it's a recreation, actually, of an actual event, um, which was the biggest gold discovery in the Philippines. So wow. this um, bulldozer operator was working on a project, and he unearthed by accident what is now considered to be one of the largest gold collections in the, Phil um, in the Philippines. We have a lot of, we had a lot of gold um, pre-Hispanic before we were colonized yes. by the Spaniards. And so he discovered all of this um, and they're now in a museum. And so I fictionalized that. The, um, the experience of exploration. Experience. Yes, right. so what, what he had gone through because it's a pretty sad story. In the end, he, he became a... Um, a pauper, you know, yes, he didn't yes. get to keep a lot of the gold that he discovered. Right, um, right. He was 
yeah, I ran into a lot of trouble with it. But so I made that um, a story about how we make choices, basically, to summarize. Yes. Yeah. But that reminds me of the old farmer who was known in China, who uh -huh. have discovered or bumped into um, the whole terracotta warrior burial. Oh, really? He was digging for a well, uh -huh. and uh, he found a hand poking up, right, <laughs> which was this one of the terracotta terracotta warriors, and he has never really been acknowledged for his contribution. Oh, to, uh -huh. Yes, and so I'm very odd story when you think about the common person mm -hmm. who out of necessity or their work discovers right. something monumental for a nation. Right. And um, an interesting part of that story about this bulldozer operator was later, many years later, when his gold collection actually made it to the museum. So he went to that museum um, during the opening and he saw this heavy gold belt that was actually in his house or, you know, when he discovered it. And he wasn't even allowed to touch it. You know, when he went over there, he wasn't acknowledged. And he wasn't even allowed to go near this valuable artifact uh -huh. when, in fact, he was the one who discovered it. So, yes, it's very similar to that story you just told. How did you go about uh, w finding the... Um publisher again because these are all different publishers right uh, or actually yes they are so this one was um, published by the Philippine American uh, power Philippine American Writers Association based in San Francisco okay, yes. yeah and was it easier to find Philippine American publications after you started with a couple more books already right yes um, so uh, being in the Midwest uh, it's there are fewer Filipino American writers here. Ray De La Cruz is one of <laughs> Glenview, yes. um, so there are a lot m more of them in New York and and the West the big Coast, cities, yes. right? Los like especially in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. basically, Ray and I we have to kind of build our own reputations where we are, and then just hope seek that out those contacts, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and the, how, was, how has the book been received? Do you hear from your readers? And so that's something that I've heard many authors find um, very rewarding. That right. you are now, we are much more able to hear from our readers mm -hmm. than ever before. Yes, yeah, so um, the, for the novel, somebody wrote to me and said, you know, your description of these places, because I go to many different places um, in that book, um, and this was of the market uh, marketplace in Manila, and he said, you know, you must have spent a lot of time in that place because I did, and that that chicken restaurant that you talk about, yeah, I know that, and I didn't have the heart to tell him there was no chicken. That was my own fabrication. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I did not spend a lot of time. This was all armchair research because oh. I was a um, I, I didn't go to a place like that. Yeah. It, it was just too So unlike dirty your other book. Yeah, unlike your other book, you didn't travel This was this time. Yeah, yeah, this is um I well, having grown up in the Philippines, I was able to imagine mm -hmm. um, let's say this place in Manila, uh, so that was easier to fabricate or imagine mm. than, let's say, the biodiversity book where I was talking about actual species and actual mm. animals and their habitats. Mm. So yeah, I would choose carefully what I um, what was fact and what I could I had liberty or license with. Yeah. So the research you did was uh, how did you do that? Now is that re is that online? The, the research that you're doing, you're, when you say armchair, or is it in an archive, or is, it, mm -hmm. or is it just, maybe sometimes it could be now with internet, you can YouTube certain sure. locations. Yes. Well, as a writer, I always use all the resources, including going out um, and being out in the field, because anybody can write a book or research online. And so the difference that I, the value that I bring as a writer is, should go past that, should go past what's available online. Although I am trained to really dig deep mm. online, um, 
But for me, that isn't sufficient. I have to actually, let's say, for the Bayou Diversity Book, experience it. Yeah. So I would go to the mangroves where the crocodiles are <laughs> so I can more accurately describe what that habitat looks like. Um, I feel that's a value that I like to bring to my writing. Amira, so did you work with other writers, like any kind of workshop? Because many writers do that for feedback and editing purposes. Tell yeah. us about your experience with uh, writers' workshops. So um, I was a member of the Off-Campus Writers' Workshop, OCWW, based in Wilmette for many years. In fact, I credit them really with all the success that I've had as a writer. In that group, um, there are writers from many places, including Glenview. And in fact, we would use um, the resources here in Glenview, you know, the venues like the public library um, for different uh, meetings we've, we have or events. And so basically, I, um, I would say that I sort of co had my writing career. I co-wrote with um, a lot of writers from this area, from the North Shore, from the Northwest suburbs. So do you yeah. read out uh, your short stories, or how do you use that opportunity? Yes, we have the opportunity in that um, organization to share manuscripts. And so whatever we're writing on, uh, working on, and it depends also um, on what kind of speaker we have speakers um, we have for that day it's every Thursday mm -hmm. then we share our manuscripts in that genre but yes yeah, so my work I have read my work to them shared with them and heard many other works which I felt was very very useful and the fine-tuning of word by word right the choice of words you get that from the workshop yes you have to be um, uh, open to oh. uh, Critique. critiques. <laughs> Is that painful? <laughs> yes. Like, All of them are well-meaning. Yes. All of mm. them well-meaning. Some of them you may not want to hear, um, but they are all very useful in the end. So which one's harder to take? The, the <laughs> critique or the rejection letters from yeah. publishers? Well, uh, well, I would say th they're both hard to take because um, the publishers you don't know personally, but the, <laughs> yes, well, the CWW you do, that you have lunch with them after, <laughs> yes, and they you, you think that they know them. you and they get you. Um, but I was the only Filipino also in that writer's workshop, uh, the only person of color sometimes in many instances. Yes. So I felt that sometimes maybe they didn't get what I was writing about right. or my voice. Yes, and the background sometimes this shows us what how much background and how rich the background is yes. in in stories from another culture. Right, and they were all always appreciative of you know the different um, language or voice that yeah. I I brought. Um, so I, I was really very thankful of that, and um, I I am really I really appreciate being around all these writers from the suburbs and from the city. Well, thank you, Amira. It was a pleasure having you on our program. It was a pleasure speaking with you, Yvonne. Uh, thank you. And join us next time on Off the Shelf.